So uh, we're here tonight for the uh, Wild Speaker Series. Our speaker will be Matt Flores with the uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife. So I'm gonna allow him to begin his share. Hello, thank you, Charlene. I'm Matthew Flores, with that a part of wildlife. I am a, what we call in the wildlife diversity division, which is basically all the animals that are non considered huntable and are not considered fishable. Um, so uh, we deal with, uh, right now I deal with desert tortoises and stuff, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about guzzlers. One second, gotta share the screen first. All right, so thank you all for coming. So a guzzler is basically, uh, this is a picture of an eagle taking a drink at one right here. So a guzzler is an artificial water development. It is uh, basically, all it does is it provides water to wildlife where there wouldn't be a water source at all. And they're 100% artificial. They are not natural features. Um, but they do provide a huge service to wildlife. We've uh, documented 63 different species getting water or getting a drink at them. So um, that, that goes everything from small songbirds, eagles, uh, the large game animals that they're designed to provide water to. Uh, we even said uh, desert tortoise uh, drinking from one uh, in the last couple of years, that was in California though. And we have uh, seen red spotted toads breeding in them as, as well. We've seen uh, tadpoles in them. So possibly other amphibians, we really don't have a perfect uh, amount of knowledge on that. So um, <clears throat> we have a bunch of different guzzlers in the state. Uh, we have basically two different sizes. We have small game guzzlers, uh, small game water development, which is basically a very small, um, they're usually about the, that, that metal piece you see on the top right there. That is about 16 by eight, usually eight, 16 feet by eight feet. And all it does is rain, snow hits it, just like it would on the roof of your house. And it goes into the gutter, just like it would if you had gutters on your house, because you, houses in Las Vegas don't seem to have that. And then it goes down into this little holding tank that's down at the bottom. And there's a ramp inside the holding tank because we are very concerned with critter, critters not drowning in there. We don't want to, anything to die trying to get a drink. And we also don't want there to potentially be a water fouling issue. So this is a large game guzzler. They're much, they're much larger. So <laughs> what we have is a very lar a much larger apron collection surface right here. This is an 80 foot by 40 foot apron. And then the water goes rainfall again, just like a tin roof. It hits that and goes down to the gutter at the very bottom of that, follows in the pipes, goes down into the, it's held in these large tanks. Uh, these tanks right here are 2,300 gallons a piece. This guzzler holds about 9,000 gallons. Over here, the red circle is what we call the drinker. It's essentially a water trough that's angled and sloped and has um, escape mechanisms so that anything that gets, you know, comes and gets a drink can get out. Um, really, the only thing we found dead consistently in there is insects, which I had insects. So, when I say that number 63 species, we are not, we have never done like a DNA sample on this. So we, we could be much higher. Um, this is a slick rock this is another feature that's sometimes part of guzzlers. Uh, basically this is a dam across a very small drainage. Uh, you, it, it's made in these exposed rocky sections. You don't wanna do a large drainage because it's just gonna silt, fill up a silt and it's gonna become a maintenance issue. So we, these are another thing that we use to try and collect water. Uh, there's a up close picture of an apron, we paint them. Every apron is painted because we don't want uh, to have a, we want to have a lake effect, which is basically we don't want to have ducks flying overhead or waterfowl flying overhead, see that, think it's a lake, come down and bounce off that thing trying to land. We want to make these as safe as possible. So a 80 acre apron, a 40 by 80 foot apron can collect, I'm look at my notes, up to about uh, 1,995 gallons of water for every one inch of rain. So if you get a typical Mojave system, you know, value of the Mojave system, uh, desert have about four inches of rain. So basically if you build an apron this size, you can count on it collecting about 7,980 gallons a year. Most of the time we don't build these in the valley bottoms because there's no large game there. 
So we build them on Southern Nevada, where I live and where I'm assuming a fair amount of us live, is the, the, the bighorn sheep is the target animal that we build most of these things for. And they live in the mountains. So we build these in the mountains that usually get six inches of rain. So the 40 by 80 apron, if we can build it, works really, really well. Uh, sometimes you'll see these older plastic aprons. We're sort of phasing them out uh, in a sense. They're, they're cheaper. They don't last as long. Um, the rodents chew on them and they develop holes. They eventually lose efficiency. Uh, metal apron is the way to go. But this is just another feature you might see. And there's a really old guzzler. That is, uh, they, the old guzzlers had these tall tanks, which had the advantage of being, you know, kind of a small footprint, can be kind of poked in anywhere. As you can see, that one uh, person balancing on top. <laughs> it, it's a very steep terrain. This is uh, in the Bear Mountains over near Beatty. And this system is flawed and it has a flow valve, which is uh, the, the thing that holds a water column in check, which is basically the same thing you have in your toilet. It, uh, it, can, fl it can fail. <laughs> unfortunately. And, and then when it fails, it dumps all the water out of these things. So that's really a critical flaw and why we're moving away from this, this style of system. So the flat tanks, what we're going for, this one's up, uh, up near Pioche. Uh, it was a pronghorn guzzler. And you can see the flat tanks in the middle. Uh, they require minimal maintenance over time. The, the flat tanks, everything is gravity fed on them. There's no moving part. It's just one water column that is the same in the drinker, it's the same in the tanks. So when the water level goes down in the drinker, as the animals drink it, it water level goes down in the tanks as well. So drinkers, critical. There's some sheep having to drink uh, up in the McCullough range. These, uh, that basically the water has to be made available and it has to be made, made available safely. So it's sort of cut out of the picture here, but there's a ramp in every drinker. Every drinker has rebar welded on it to provide escape for bats that may become lodging them. Uh, sometimes you'll see rocks piled inside of them. And we do that because we, we wanna increase the amount of escape that is available to these animals. So fences, we, we do fence a lot of these things. Uh, that's because a lot of them are in grazing. Sometimes they're in grazing allotments. Sometimes they are, have uh, feral horses that uh, these guzzlers are just not designed to provide water to. You know, if we had a population of feral horses on a guzzler that had 9,000 gallons, they would drink it down pretty dang fast. It, would be, it wouldn't last the summer. We'd have to build a much larger system. So we uh, don't have feral horse guzzlers that are maintained by the state wildlife department. So 63 different species in Missouri using guzzlers, everything, large animals. Here's some mountain lions getting a drink up on the desert game range. So we, like I said, there's been toads that have been spotted breeding in them. So these, and these, Structures, they provide water to a system that would more or less be devoid of water for the most part. Uh, one thing that we've seen a study that uh, out of Arizona was a Sonoran pronghorn will drink if they if water is available. What this allows these animals to do, because they're limited uh, by the water they get within their food, their, their metabolic water, it's called. So these animals will get a lot of their water from the food they consumed. However, that forces them because their rumen is uh, only so big, just like uh, they, would, they would, can only get so much and they can only, they have to shift from eating higher protein forage, which they're dependent upon to lower quality, higher water por forage like cactus that doesn't have a lot of protein in it that, that uh, the, these animals need, especially the, the, the ewes that are, you know, probably nursing their, their lambs. So. Uh, use drink the most water. They really drink the best data I can find on it is a little less than a gallon a day, but that <laughs> that data is very flawed and we haven't really nailed that number down as how much water a bighorn sheep or even a mule deer in desert conditions would consume because it's so variable on the condition of the vegetation, the condition of the animal, and the actual uh, astronomical conditions like how hot is it, how hot is the night. Uh, so We've seen the rams come in and they drink maybe once every three days. They don't need near as much water as we use, but uh, they do congregate because they want to be where the user are at. So currently we have 366 big game guzzlers across Nevada. That's a lot. We have 1,286 small game guzzlers. That's a real lot. Guzzlers are also in Hawaii, they're in Texas, they're in Arizona, they're in eight, eight other states all in the arid west because why would you build a guzzler where you get a whole bunch of rain? So just a quick rundown. 
guzzlers, they've been, they've been ongoing since 1956. Most of the early guzzlers were small game guzzlers. Uh, it wasn't until the 70s, approximately, when they began building the big game ones. But the exception is on the Desert Game Range, where they were doing guzzler construction since the 50s. So it really ramped up in the 80s. Uh, after they, the BLM and the Department of Wildlife and Fish and Wildlife Service conducted a habitat management plan, herd management plans for these animals. So currently right now, uh, the, our focus has shifted to trying to make these things as sustainable as possible. Uh, there's been very few new guzzler sites built within the last uh, 10 years. There's been two in the McCulloughs, and that was to try and rectify a downward trending population of sheep. So we're not really aggressively building these things anymore. Uh, when I was in this position for five years, I built two other new guzzlers. So yeah, the goal here is, and I rebuilt maybe 25, 30. The goal here is to make these existing guzzlers as sustainable as possible for what has become a changing environment, which it's, it's warming. <laughs> and we need to be able to provide for these sheep, but I'll get into that more later. And I'm also getting into, but why do we do this? So most of the reason why we do this is to mitigate the loss of springs. So what happened when um, settlers first came or European settlers first came into this, uh, this desert area, they found springs, they were raising cattle, they took out their drills and they drilled out the springs and they got more water out of them. And that's, was great for them. That's, that's wonderful. They did a great job. However, in these perched aquifers that are only recharged by a very small amount of precipitation, four inches is nothing, uh, considering, you know, even a, a dry desert can get up to 12. These, it takes a long time for these springs to recharge. And some of these springs have never really recovered from being drilled out or being tampered with or however it happened. They've also been outright developed. I mean, look at Springs Preserve in Las Vegas. As a perfect example of that, we built the city around that. That's no longer providing any wildlife value to bighorn sheep, at least. Uh, definitely, it's great for birds when they, if they fixed it and restored it. But uh, Duck Creek, another example that probably had bighorn sheep coming off the McCullough Range to water, but it's now you know Green Valley Parkway. So that that these large sources of water were no longer there for these sheep. Another another obstacle that is no was you know never around. <laughs> when these animals were evolving was our highway system, which crisscrosses all over the place and has fragmented these, these mountain ranges. Bighorn sheep predominantly hang out in the mountains. That's it. If you see them down in the valley bottoms, that's a rare occurrence. They wanna be where they can escape. They wanna be where they can run up a mountain and laugh at you because you can't run up a mountain nearly as fast as sheep. And now they can mountain lions, which is their main predator. So they've survived by being able to run uphill uh, away from predators. So they stay where they feel safe, which is in the mountains. So their mountain range, if they were in a mountain range that didn't get any rain, they would gravitate to a much larger one, like say the sheep range or the spring range where there were more larger perennial springs or they gravitate to the areas that had water. And they can't move with the same amount of freedom that they used to be able to move to with. So that's definitely changed and, it and our management style has to adapt as well. So bighorn do uh, the bighorn shuffle. They move from uh, winter range, which is pretty much any area that is near what we call escape terrain, which is terrain that is close to about 13% slope. Uh, and they like to hang out in there. That's really nasty stuff. And that's where they feel comfortable. That's where they make a living. They run around foraging all the time, but during the summer months, they can track to what is known as summer range, which is predominantly two miles from a water source. So during the summer, if you want to go see bighorn sheep, get up early and go two miles to a water source and they will more than likely be there because that's just, they're dependent on that water at that time, especially the ewes. Uh, like I said, the ewes uh, drink about a little over, a little under, a little over a gallon of water a day because they are, uh, you know, nursing a, um, a lamb. So they drop their lambs in the south of the state uh, around February, like around now, they're probably dropping lambs. And then they're still nursing through the summer months. So the ewes show up on water pretty much early, mid to late spring, depending on how good the 
winter rains were and how good the green up was because they need that water resource because they need to have that protein. They need to focus on that high forage stuff. Like I said, their, their rumen, which is their stomach, is not big. It's like trying to drink a whole bunch of water and then eating a big meal at the same time. You're going to feel bloated, sick, your stomach. You're not going to be able to pull it off. So they need to, they're limited by what their rumen can take and what they can get metabolically. So that ties them to water. Usually the rams will show up if it's a decent year when it's time to, when it's time to rut. They want to be where the females are and that's when they fight and they do the whole thing uh, where they conk heads. I, I, I've seen it here in the Mojave. You don't see them running at each other and conking heads. They kind of size each other up a little more, a little more lazy. But <clears throat> anyways, but the main reason why we build these guzzlers is to aid in population recovery. So this is a little bit of a, a reimagining of where bighorn sheep were within the state. <laughs> this is not as factually based as it possibly could be because we've just lost that data to the annals of history. But this is basically where bighorn sheep habitat, where the Department of Wildlife has determined bighorn sheep habitat to exist within the state. This is so it's a reasonable assumption to assume that, that it was occupied before bighorn, before settlers showed up and you know, mess it all up. So this is bighorn sheep in uh, just a hundred years later. And you can see it contracted significantly. And what is the reason why that contraction took place is probably a multiple of reasons because it always is. But the big reason is that settlers brought with them their livestock, their sheep, their cows, their horses that had never set foot on this continent before. With them, they brought diseases uh, that were never on this continent before. And those diseases got into the wild sheep population. The big one is the, the ovo pneumonia, which has still, is still wreaking havoc within the sheep herds. Um, but what is really interesting about this graphic is you kind of can see it and you see that basically the sheep held out around Las Vegas, they held out around Tonopah, and then they held out in this, these really rugged mountains in the center part of the state. Uh, and when you look at it, it's really where sheep uh, ranching occurred within the state. Uh, it becomes really too dry once you pass this line right here. Uh, once, and they, sheep ranching was never all that successful. Uh, the reason why there's a shop off here, I'm, my assumption is because of Ash Meadows was able to had sheep and Oasis Valley up near Beatty had large water sources that people were raising sheep on. And the sheep were able to spread the pneumonia to the wild sheep population. So the bighorn got the pneumonia and they tanked. It's just what happened. Another thing that supports this theory is hunting records from that time around, uh, what was it 1890, 1900, you saw the hunters were consistently taking bighorn sheep. And about the turn of the century, about 1900, they stopped. And I don't think it was because all of a sudden the, they became bad shots or just, they shifted to, de to de they started shooting lots of deer. And that's because the sheep just weren't around for them to shoot. So that sort of supports the theory that the bighorn sheep got sick about that time and pneumonia burned through for the first time ever. And it tanked out the populations, unfortunately. So now <laughs> we have our current distribution. So you can, the, we, it's expanded significantly. And you also see that we have, it's, it's been subdivided into three, I'm hesitant to call them subspecies because they're not subspecies. They're sort of just <laughs> Boone and Crockett, but not quite scores, it's just sort of this weird division. Uh, we have what's called California bighorn sheep up in the northern part of the state, up, uh, north of uh, Highway 80. We have the desert bighorn sheep uh, and this big green population making up the bulk of the Nevada state population. And you have the Rocky Mountain, which is an actual recognized subspecies of bighorn sheep that is in pretty much in these higher northern ranges. Um, so uh, these, this is in part due to the water development, the success of the water development program. It's also in part due to an aggressive trap and transplant program. So uh, that started in the 70s. And uh, the big push to, they developed everywhere. They built guzzlers in a, a significant amount of, of mountain ranges across the state, across Nevada. And, uh, and that was because of the water sources being either appropriated uh, for industrial uses, such as mining, ranching, everything that makes our quality of life better. Um, it sort of came at expense of the sheep, unfortunately. Uh, at least there are water sources in the desert. So some large springs have been lost. May, we may never get them back. 
So guzzlers are somewhat of a mitigation structure to keep these sheep populations on the landscape at a healthy level. So Nevada has the most bighorn of any state. I can say that with a degree of pride and we should all be proud of that. Uh, Nevada has been very successful in its ability to manage bighorn sheep populations for population growth. And Nevada has become a net exporter of sheep to other states, so, uh, Texas, Utah, have have had lots of sheep gone to it. Arizona's had sheep gone to it. Nevada has become, has exported sheep throughout the West. I, I don't know how the exact list of states that Nevada has exported to, but that's something to be quite proud of. So, uh, and I wanna go out saying that natural sources are by far superior to guzzers. A guzzer is a poor replacement, unfortunately, for a natural spring. And, and that's because in the saying that guzzers take maintenance. Guzzlers, guzzlers take uh, you know, they, they, can, they can go dry. <laughs> uh, springs are much more reliable. Springs provide repairing areas. Springs provide more ecological services than a guzzler can. Guzzlers are good at providing water to sheep. They're good at providing water for what they're providing drinking water, but they, they don't create these, you know, thermocleans and all these other micro habitats that a spring would make. So I'm no means advocating that we don't need springs. Springs should be protected. Springs should be restored. They're, they're, uh, more important than guzzlers. <laughs> so we pick these guzzler sites based on what the species need. They are designed to oftentimes work in tandem. They're designed to work within habitat. We don't build them in with the, the fill the dreams philosophy. Like if you build it, they will come. We build them within habitat to augment existing habitats. Uh, sometimes we have been overly successful. The Muddy Mountains, for example, have probably have too many sheep on them, probably more than they are above carrying capacity. And that's in part because the, the pneumonia has not, somehow not gotten that herd, has not gotten that herd. The only pneumonia free herd within Nevada and within the, possibly the entire West and that sheep population just continues to grow. And that creates challenges uh, for us because for a long time we were trapping sheep out of that population and sending them to other mountain ranges, sending them to other states. That is no longer the case because of the pneumonia. No, because we can't really mix up these sheep populations. We can't, you don't want to put a different strain of pneumonia out on the landscape and, and to the detriment of sheep. Because what, what happens when they get this pneumonia is the, some will recover and some will build up some herd immunity to it. Uh, unfortunately, what we witness is the lambs, they get antibodies from their mom but once they are weaned off their mother's milk and they're no longer getting those antibodies, they are not producing antibodies themselves. So what you'll see is the lambs will then die off. They'll get pneumonia and they, most of them won't survive, unfortunately. So the problem with these, once pneumonia gets in these herds, the recruitment stays low for a long period of time. And then they just can't, <laughs> they can't, the population doesn't grow. So we've seen that within the McCullough range uh, which has a lot of the McCullough range is a lot of connectivity to other bighorn sheep herds within Southern Nevada and California. And unfortunately, that is where we've seen multiple different invasions of different strains of pneumonia that have really hurt that herd. Um, we've seen it in the River Mountains uh, most recently. Uh, it was, was once disease free. Uh, if you've been up to Hemingway Park, you've seen the sheep. They're all hanging out on the golf course in the soccer field right there. Uh, unfortunately, those sheep are now have pneumonia and it's not uncommon to see him coughing and suffering from it. So uh, one of the things we do is we load up the helicopter and we move these, all these materials into the mountain range for to where the sheep are. So they'll use these guzzlers. To, these, these sheep are wilderness associated animals. They benefit from uh, wilderness areas and from lack of interaction with humans, basically. So we build them in areas that are similar to wilderness. So that adds immense value if, to, to, to these guzzlers. And they're protected from anyone that can drive up, that <laughs> potentially can vandalize these things. It, it adds a really big degree of protection. So these guzzlers are intended to entirely fill up and recharge or get all their water from the rainfall. They're designed to not need any maintenance at all. They're, that's the goal with these things is to not, to, to build them and walk away and then let the sheep show up. 
But um, some years, drought years, and we're seeing this more often now, are not, we don't get enough winter storms because they recharge in the wintertime to fill up these guzzlers. So when we get a significant drought year, we have a difficult decision to make. Do we let the guzzler just go dry and the sheep will just deal? Or do we water haul? Which basically means we take water and we directly deposit it within the guzzler to mitigate the drought. So this is an example of how we water haul. Sometimes we use the helicopter, sometimes we haul on ground. Well, we set up a, a, a dipping station. This is just this last year when we had the extreme uh, drought event, the 200 days of dry weather. So the water, the helicopter comes in, we turn the volume off because that's no need for that. So the, the helicopter's got, you'll see below it, it's got a 200 uh, gallon Bambi bucket, the same kind they'd use for fighting fires. And our pilot comes in and he flies over uh, to where the, the apron is. And he is gonna drop the water right there. Uh, there's another guzzler biologist, that's Sam, the new guzzler biologist. He is, uh, we had the, we noticed the water kind of was coming down a little too much force and it was running over the gutter. So we uh, clamped on some, some flashing. Uh, that's about six inches tall and it wasn't enough. So Sam's there getting a little bit of a bath to make sure that as much water goes into the guzzler as we can get into the guzzler. Um, we did this aggressively last year, very aggressively. I, I don't know the exact numbers of water that the department hauled. It was over 100,000 gallons and it was very aggressive. We, this is not an ideal situation. This is not what we want to be doing. This is not how we want to manage the sheep. This is very expensive, obviously, because uh, the helicopter's involved. What we want is to build these things sustainably so that they are able to function without us having to do anything like this. Uh, unfortunately, if we did not do this, we would have sheep die. We would have sheep move around. And that is somewhat unacceptable when we are trying to use these sheep to sell hunting tags for them. Because the way we operate and the way we create conservation dollars is through selling off certain species um, that are desirable for hunting purposes. And then we use that to generate revenue to do all the conservation that we do statewide. So uh, if we, we can't really have uh, these, these animals dying and still have them be huntable. And take that for what you will, but that is the reality of conservation. And so uh, we work with a lot of volunteer groups. Uh, this is a volunteer group we work with very closely uh, called the Fraternity of Desert Bighorn. Uh, they are 100% volunteer organized, not for profit. If you, when we can do construct these things, we reach out to the local community. We look for volunteers that want to come out that want to help us build. You don't need to have any skills. We'll teach you. We have competent people on the mountain, friendly people that will help you out. You can get involved. Uh, the volunteers, they generate significant amount of in-kind dollars. That's how we pay for our, our program as well, through our federal matching grant. Uh, we would not be able to have uh, the kind of impact that we do have without our volunteers. So uh, this is my plug for you guys to get involved. There's two websites you can get involved at. There's other volunteer opportunities if building guzzles is in your jam. So... Um, you can get involved with, you know, other things, education, whatnot. And that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Awesome. All right. Um, do we have any questions from our participants? Uh, I have a question. This is Hermie. Hey, Hermie, how are you? Hi. Is... Um, Years and years ago, I was at Big Bertha. Does that still exist? Yes. Does it? <laughs> really? It does. it does. In fact, we, we, re we recently rebuilt it because it wasn't working. Wow. <laughs> and we're in the process of rebuilding the, all the rest of them in the Mormon Mountains as well. Okay. Uh, Big Bertha was built in 1980. It's as old as I am. So. I know. I know I've been there. <laughs> it's a long ATV ride to get there. <laughs> it's a long walk, too. It's a very long walk. <laughs> and we basically rebuilt it. Uh, we built a modern system. We ripped up the, the, uh, the entirety of the apron footprint. I'm really proud to say with that one, we kept it 100% within the cherry stem. 
Well, as was directed by the BLM. <laughs> and uh, we actually kept the footprint of the guzzler within the 100% of the old footprint of the guzzler as well. So we had no net loss of any habitat at all. So I'm, I was excited about that. <laughs> that, was, that was long overdue. Right, thank you. Do you have a question? Hey, Matt, can you put up the last slide of the volunteer information where we need to go? Absolutely. Thanks. And I have a, uh, another question from the chat from Sandra Holloway. Um, do you have a map of the guzzlers or? Uh, we do, I don't have one in this PowerPoint. We actually sell a guzzler atlas, it's 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, these are common knowledge. <laughs> you can see them a lot on Google Earth if you poke around on Google Earth a lot. And, and uh, how, if you're really how, interested in, I'm sorry, what? I was gonna say, how many do we have statewide? Statewide map? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah. How many do you think we have? How many uh, we have, uh, what was my graphic? It was 360 big game, 1200 small game. Wow. So we have a lot. Um, it, it, statewide map would look really cluttered. <laughs> so we have a lot of them. Um, we have them up north built for elk, built for pronghorn, built for. Uh, other critters, we have them down here. They're predominantly for bighorn sheep. We have a few elk guzzlers. There's one elk guzzler in the sheep uh, in the spring mountains. Deer do use them when they are in the sheep range as well. But I mean, I don't have a map in my PowerPoint, sorry. Um, I have a question from Facebook. Um, what does guzzler inspection involve? Guzzler inspecting, I'm glad you asked, thank you. You can sign to be a guzzler inspector. Basically, all we really want to know uh, for most people is if there's a problem with it. If you see a leak, you can report it. And that's take a picture. You can send it to, to either myself or Sam. Uh, we'll be the best place to do it. We have a guzzler hotline. Should put, probably put that in the information. Sorry. Um, and we want to know water levels. Uh, if you're out and about, hiking around uh, or hiking to a guzzler to check out wildlife, we would love to know what the water level is. Uh, that can be, you just, if it's a tall tank system, you're gonna have to, uh, the easiest way to do it is kind of knock on the tank and get an estimate. So you'll knock on it, you'll sound kind of hollow, knock on it, and the temperature will change too. <laughs> it's a warm day. So then, and you can, you can estimate the water column on that. And on the tall tanks, there will actually be a, uh, a measurement on the side that'll tell you how many gallons are in each tank. For the Flat system, tank systems, all we need to know is the amount of water column in the drinker. So you could either stick a stick in and eyeball it for us. That's all we really need. If you, if you happen to have a tape measure in your pocket, get us an official reading. But I don't usually hike with a tape measure unless I'm going to a guzzler. So <laughs> we do have a, with the fraternity Desert Bighorn, which is uh, these guys back here, uh, they do have an adopt a guzzler program. Uh, and I would strongly recommend you guys get in contact with these guys. Their website is the one at the bottom desertbighorn.com and they'll help you out. I can, if you get in touch with me or if you're really interested afterwards, I send me your email. I can send you a map where these guzzers are. So you can know. Um, some of them are a hike. <laughs> uh, so, there's a fair amount you can drive to up north more than down south, but we, if you want to become a guzzler volunteer, that's a good way to start. And did you want me to uh, share your email in the chat? Sorry, what? You're, yeah, uh, go ahead. You can share my email in the chat. That's absolutely fine. All right. Uh, another question from the chat. Uh, Jenny Chapman, uh, do you monitor all of the guzzlers? Uh, how is the monitoring done? Cameras, other sensors? We would love to put remote sensing on these things, um, but we have had issues with vandalism and co overall cost. Uh, so what we do monitor these things, uh, we rely on volunteers, but every year uh, at the end of February, early March, we jump in a helicopter and the guzzler biologist goes around and goes to almost every single guzzler within his area. We have three guzzler biologists from the state 
Um, and up north, they do it towards the summer. Down south, we do it here in the late winter. So we visit every guzzler once. That includes the ones that are on the Air Force range on the NTTR or the Nevada Test and Training Range, sorry. And the, um, we work in tandem with the Air Force to get a, a day when we can get out and do that. Uh, some of them are not visited as regularly. The small game ones, for example, are not visited as regularly. Uh, those are visited when people have time to go check them out. Uh, we get reports from, we get a lot of reports from hunters that are visiting these things during the hunting season if they're dry. That's when we rely on the on small game checks. So we are reliant on eyes and ears on the ground, uh, people volunteering information to us. Um, and that's, other than that, we check them on foot, <laughs> which uh, we only have so many days that we can, that's feasible. Uh, and she just chimed in. Uh, she said she was wondering about keeping track of animal use. Uh, and she noted the photos yes. uh, in your presentation. So, so how are those gathered? We put trail cameras out occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's sort of this, uh, usually what we're doing because trail cameras are, may require maintenance. They require you to go get your back to get your cameras. Uh, you can't put them in the wilderness um, without a, a permit, but we do put them out on guzzlers. Uh, and it's sort of, we basically, have, what, what I was doing was I was selecting a mountain range. We deploy them, put them out, and we try to get a capture on sheep numbers was the goal. Every year, the game biologist, uh, he goes up in the helicopter and he counts the bighorn sheep in his areas. It's a bi -week, biannually uh, survey he does or she does. And it, the goal is to try and tabulate how many sheep we have on the landscape, how they're doing, if they're recruiting and whatnot. There is a Nevada game atlas that that information will be published in that is available online on the, the NDOT website. So you can see what the game biologist feels about every herd in the state. <laughs> um, Kevin Kigma asks, uh, would there be a way to use drones to to check on guzzlers? Absolutely. I would love to use drones to check on guzzlers. It's a drone is no excuse not to get out there and look on foot. But um, we've tried to get drones. The difficulty is sort of tripped us up within the federal government, the state government operating drones. Uh, we're subject to a lot of FAA regulations that uh, private citizens are not, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, however, we still are looking into it. I would, and I, that's just the future of it. It's, it's going that direction. It's cheaper. It's more effective. It's better. It's a better way of monitoring. So absolutely. That's the direction we want to go. We're not there yet. All right. I'm going to circle back through, uh, Facebook. See if there are any additional questions. Yeah, it looks like we're pretty, pretty much in the clear over there. So uh, to wrap it up, Matt, uh, you left it with the get involved uh, screen up. Uh, Okay, so question on Facebook, uh, do they have a vaccine for the pneumonia in sheep? Unfortunately, they do not have a vaccine for the pneumonia. It uh, has multiple different strains and we would have to then administer it as well. Uh, I know they've done stuff with uh, black-footed ferrets with a vaccine for the, uh, dis oh, what the heck's that stuff that they had? <laughs> I'm throwing a blank on that, but I know they, they shot jelly beans out of, a cannon or something, <laughs> the ferrets that ate the vaccine. In it. But unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine available for the bighorn sheep pneumonia. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other diseases that affect them as well that I didn't really get into. There's a pastorella, which makes it worse. There's, um, they get tumors with inside their nasal sinus fat cavities. Unfortunately, these animals are very susceptible to respiratory diseases. And that's probably just a result of evolving in an arid area. They just didn't have to put a lot of, you know, evolutionary pressure into making themselves uh, responsive to diseases. So it's just 
it's just the way they're built, unfortunately. Yeah. So, so the best thing we do now is just keep the populations separate. Yes, that's the that's what we're doing right now. I I, I don't know if we'll ever actively manage uh, by administering a vaccine. That's very cost. That's very not very cost effective. Um, you need to continue to you need to give them boosters. It's it, it's. It sounds great. It would be great if we could do it. It's difficult to pull off in practice. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. Yeah. Other than that, you got a couple of thank yous in here. Um, great info, great presentation. So I want to echo the same and say thank you, Matt. Thank you all for listening. This is this blow hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good, man. Great presentation. So, uh, Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, either on Facebook or here on Zoom for coming out. Uh, enjoy your evening, Matt. Thanks for uh, doing this for us. Uh, we appreciate you. And uh, everyone, uh, have a great night. Thank you very much, Charlene. I appreciate all you're doing. Yeah, you're welcome. See you. Right, take it easy. Bye.